sister-in-law, Diana, uh, is married to my oldest brother, Wayne, who's a lot older than I am, so I can say it because they had to step out, they had to head off now, but they're down from Grand Forks, and one of my nieces, uh, Grace, was here as well, too. Um, my oldest brother, Wayne, is actually on the plane right now flying to Peru, and uh, they were missionaries and have been missionaries for many years as well. And uh, they're on their way to Peru. He's on his way to Peru to set up uh, Christian radio stations. That's what he does and travels around and uh, uh, implements radio stations that go thousands and thousands of miles to the Amazonian people and the jungles. And yeah, pretty cool. Father's business. What is the father's business? What, what is it that, that our father... God himself, what is his business? What is it that he, he desires to accomplish and do in this place? And, and we could say, well, there's kingdom business. Absolutely, we agree completely with kingdom business. Kingdom business is your business or your employment where you are establishing such a foothold um, of God's presence that the business becomes successful because of his glory on it. That's a kingdom business, okay? And how that works is not always necessarily taking a Bible and hitting someone over the head and saying, believe in Jesus. It was old school, we call it. It doesn't work as good in the workforce because there's a lot of lawyers out there that would love to take that and sue you because the Bibles hurt people, right? That's what they think. But it's actually living a biblical life in everything you do, every business you're involved in, every ministry that you're a part of, uh, wherever it is, it's living a Christian life in such a capacity that the favor of God comes upon you and it will guarantee to infect everyone around you. That's the reality. Well, I don't want an infection. To be infected by his presence is a good thing. It's a very good thing. And you'll start to see in business how that, how that presents itself. All of a sudden, you'll realize without even striving for it, there's going to be shifts and changes in favor that's going to come upon it. But what is God's business? What is it, what is it that, that he's in business to do? My goodness, I never thought God had a business. Uh, he did in creating you. His business, I look at in this concept, is really his church. His business, his, his bride that he's pouring into, and you say, I don't want to see church as a business. Well, in Canada, church has to be a business. It's called a corporation. Um, we're registered in, in British Columbia, plus you have a charitable number. Um, it's, it's very much business in, the, in this place. We have to pay for electricity and lights and taxes and, and lawnmowers. Oh, no, that wasn't the city. But, you know, it's just all this stuff that goes on in church is business. How can we relate with his presence with business? Part of his presence is his business. It's his business to give you his presence. Well, how do we foster that? How do we, how do we work on that? Is there a formula? I'm this business person, mindset in business, CEOs. In my mind, I, I, I formulate things. I can put things together and things will be successful if we do this and do this. In church, how do we correlate that biblically? Because it has to happen. If we didn't, we'd have no order. If we just said, okay, let's not do any business in this building. All of the board of directors, no need for them anymore. No need for business. You would soon find collection agency stickers on the front. You'd find uh, BC Hydro. Uh, is it still BC Hydro? Yeah, okay, uh, saying, whoa, you, know, you haven't paid your bills, you haven't done this. So really, if you take a look at the fullness of the bride of Christ, the structure of church itself is actually the business model of God. It's the business model that he has created for us to live a representation of his kingdom here in this place. And when we come into this place, we're literally to take that part of his kingdom, an understanding, a revelation that we receive as we gather together, because the gathering of the saints is a very biblical principle. We take that as we gather together, and we, we, when we walk out those doors... We carry it, this portion, with us. And everywhere we walk, depending on the portion you choose to grab, that portion, this, who wants to be big portion? Then grab a big portion. Take a big portion. But you can't take a big portion and then all of a sudden walk to the doors, oh, and just leave it here and we'll walk out. 
because he won't give you the portion next time you come to that extent because you weren't worthy with the portion that he gave you. So if, you want, if we come in here into worship, we come in here to praise him and glorify his name, coming together in unity, which is like the oil flowing down the beard of Aaron. It, it, it literally is what, 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 what gives his kingdom at hand the strength it needs in our circle. If we don't have that unity, we'll, we'll, we'll literally, it, it'll, it'll disintegrate. We won't, we, won't, we won't get along. We have a unity in this place. There is such a, a growing and a gathering together that it literally is automatically increasing his presence, his manifest, manifested authority. It will automatically increase it because it's one of the laws of the kingdom. One of the laws of the kingdom is unity. Two or more gathered, he is there with you. In his name, when two come together, ten times authority of one. So if just two of us were here together, Paul and I now walk in ten times authority together than we ever could have by ourselves. So I expect and understand that when we marry together, we literally increase the ministry's authority by ten times, both county and wind. Word. <laughs> Woo! And doing that, we now walk with the understanding, knowing that we actually have more authority than we ever could have had if we hadn't come together. But let's say we were in here, and oh, the worship, you guys, that was amazing worship. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely awesome. Okay, we're greedy. Oh, don't be greedy. Okay, hungry then. A hungry person is usually referred to as a greedy person, but we accept it because they're so hungry, it's okay if they push in line to get it first. When you see someone starving, I've, I've been into Africa, many nations in India, and we fed hungry people. Do you realize sometimes how, how loss of order will happen when someone's starving to death and all they see is food? But it's not loss of order, it's actually order of the kingdom that they should get fed first. They're hungry. <laughs> it's okay, I, 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 had, I, had, I had supper yesterday. But they're starving. They haven't had a supper for a year or two, and they, they, they're eating one half of a meal a day, and that's it. Let me move aside. Come, come, get the food. Get the food. You're thirsty? Yeah, I've been in the desert. I'm dying. Wow, I just had a big bottle of water in a pickup truck 10 minutes ago. Uh, come get the water. Come drink. Culture of honor culture of honor establishing itself in such a capacity that it literally will bless the person that steps aside, not to decrease themselves, but to actually increase by giving the culture of honor to somebody else so they can be fed. Now we're in the church. Oh, big steak. I'm carrying out this big steak and eggs on Saturday men's breakfast. They're carrying it out. Well, what do you do with it? Well, I can't get through the door. Then turn sideways and go through. But keep carrying it. Don't leave it here. Why? Because God is continually giving manna into this place. Manna. Carry it with you. When lifeline, man, I smelt them cooking this morning. It made me hungry. I'm thinking, lifeline, what do they do? They cook the food here. And right after the service, they're preparing it to go out and take it to where it needs to go. Take it to the people. Take it to the hungry. We need volunteers. We need to continually volunteer for this. If you haven't been a part of it, help. Go down and serve. God's business, his actual business of, of what he's establishing, he already owns his kingdom. He already owns the establishment of the heavens. He already owns that. He owns all of that. What he doesn't fully own is the free will he gave you. And he's looking for you to give that will back to him in serving him and producing for him on this earth. He can't own it because he gave it to you as a free will. He can't own your decisions he, because he gave it to you as, as you have to make those decisions yourself. But his heart is the same as we sung today, that I want to give you my heart, fullness of it. The fear of the, this statement, this, I'm going to say a statement, if the church is really about the Father's business, his kingdom, his, his business, his kingdom at hand, his kingdom to be established on this earth, then everything you do for God will have some connection to the church. 
If the church, the bride of Christ, is really about his kingdom come, his will be done, his established power, his established authority through the blood of Jesus Christ and his resurrection and the Holy Spirit empowered in us, if his will, his business, his desire is about that, then everything we do will have a certain connection to the church. Now, it could be a home group, could be a home church, could be this church, this ministry, could be anything, but it's gonna have a connection because it's about his bride. This building is wonderful, but the reality is the bride that is in the building. The building's going to end. It's going to collapse one day. I don't know what it's going to do, but it's not going to live forever. But you and I will, if we know him as our Lord and Savior. But the fear of this statement is, oh no, you know, here we go. Another God, another preacher preaching about, you know, got to serve, got to commit, got to be a part of the church, scare the daylights out of me. Well, the reason we're scared of it is because it's been abused. And when it's been abused, we sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's like I look at all these Eastern religions that have used such biblical principles, some of them. Let's say one of them, a New Age concept. I remember when New Age was popping out, one of their biggest things was meditation. I'm a Baptist boy. We didn't meditate. New Age. But the reality is, is I'm like, oh, they stole it from us. Let's meditate on him daily. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, for his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law of the Lord he meditates day and night. Psalms 1. I'm going to meditate. I'm just not going to put two fingers together and hum. We're, we, get, we sometimes get fearful. Oh, no. Preach the church. Got to burn myself out, got to beat myself up, got to do all that. No, actually, you don't burn out in the church when everyone's serving in it. You actually get life in it. The problem is is sometimes it boils down to just a few that serve, then they do burn out. And that's what we've got to make sure. We as a body don't do that. We need to make sure that what we're actually doing is building the Father's kingdom, his business at hand. Just because man has made some mistakes in the church does not change God's desire for the church. Man's made a ton of mistakes in the church and outside the church. We tend to to sometimes pinpoint, the world loves to pinpoint on the mistakes that man or woman has made in the church. But it doesn't disqualify the church. What usually, we must understand that church is the bride of Christ and not some special denomination or group. When we pray, when I pray, I pray for the churches of this whole valley and the churches of this world. I would be just ecstatic if a a church in Langley or a church in Abbotsford kept filling up. They had to keep moving to get a bigger building. That would make me excited because it's kingdom. It's kingdom. If ours fills up and we, we have to go to multiple services, praise God, that's awesome. But that's not why I do church, just so ours will. I do church so all the churches fill up and get filled with his glory. What usually separates the church from the kingdom of God is when man's way overpowers God's way. We need to make sure that that we don't let our own understanding overpower God's will be done. And it's easy to do. Believe me, when you're a driven leader, it's easy. People feel like they get hurt, you know, and I don't like hurting people. Paul didn't want to hurt people. None of us want to hurt people. God gives us a vision. We go for it. That's what I do. Is that okay? When God says go, can we go? Right away. Do it now. Amen. We are. We're right in the midst of it. God's way has brought his kingdom to the church. His way, not your way, brought his kingdom here. His way brought the kingdom here. Not your way brings the presence of God. His way brings the presence Not your understanding, but his understanding. So what we do and what we need to be doing as members and as the church and as leadership is, what is your way, Lord? How can we accomplish your will to be done? How can we establish the kingdom, a foundation strong enough that it will literally be supporting Churches and people and young people that are not even born yet. Kevin and Donna Stoddy had a 
beautiful little boy on Saturday. Judah David goes along with Elisha, their son. We're just excited about that. Healthy delivery. Baby was awesome. We saw them that night, Saturday night. It was just, uh, just amazing. God's way has brought his kingdom to the church. He's just waiting for the church to come into his way. Well, I'm happy on how we do it. We've done it this way all the time. Well, his way is probably really excited to get us not to do the same thing, but to actually experience the newness of him every day. You know, it's one thing, let's say you get married, husband and wife, they get married. Honeymoon night, the next day, you know, together, and, and you don't do the same exact lifestyle you did while you were still single living on your own. Like, you don't get up and, man, you don't brush your teeth and spit and drool all over the, you know, the countertop and not clean it up after. Man, you put the seat down on the toilet after. You don't leave it up anymore. Right? Basic principles that change, you change. If you don't, you're unhappy, believe me. It's not a good way to live life. It's a better way to live life when you change to, to be married together. I love communication. Can you tell? Anyways, I love communication. I, I'm a communicator, and so I'm, I, I, I was always trying to get Sharon to communicate more, and let's talk, and get her a cell phone, and, and sweetheart, why do I buy you, you know, a couple hundred minutes every month, and you use about three or four? I mean, it's like, sweetheart, let's talk. Let's communicate, and, and now, you know, we, we do. It's just like a natural thing. She gets off work. She gives me a call. I get off work. I give her a call, and, and it's just a natural thing. What's happened is the marriage has actually changed us in such a way I couldn't imagine living single anymore. I just couldn't imagine it, you know? But God, God wants that to happen in his church. Live the whole Bible in your life. This word of God today, live it. Live it. Sometimes you'll see me before the service and worship, and, and I just, I'll put the Bible on my heart, and I'll just worship him. Maybe I'll put it to my mind, and, and I'll say, you know, Lord, just impart into my mind, like transform my mind so I think this word, the truth, onto my lips, Lord God. Let, let me speak your word and, and speak your truth and boldness and fill my lungs with your word, Lord God, so every cell of my body is truth. Say, well, isn't that, uh, uh, what, what do they call, uh, like a repetitional tradition? No, no. You do what you need to do. Everyone has something extraordinary to give in life. Everyone in this room, look to someone, look to either your right or, look to your right and left and say, you have something extraordinary to give. And the challenge in life, the challenge is to actually find that extraordinary in every person. Yeah, but that's weird. Maybe it's extraordinary. They're extraordinary. You're extraordinary. You weren't created cloned. You created, you were created extraordinary. Arise, O bride, and see what I can do, says the Lord. We must move from where we are and move to where we're destined to be. And I believe that's every day we move forward. Every day we move forward. Every day we move forward because we're on a journey, a highway of holiness. We're on a journey, a highway of holiness. Why would you be on a highway of holiness? To get somewhere. When we get out, drive out of the parking lot, and whether you go right or left on 264, the 52nd, or the freeway, you're getting on there. Why are you getting in your car? To go sit there? To say, wow, I like my car. Well, yeah, that happens sometimes, men. You, you understand that? Yeah. If I had a T-bird, I'd do that. I'm just kidding. I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. A highway of holiness, why, why, why would we even have it? Because it, we have to go somewhere. You get in your car, why do you have a car? Well, so you can get somewhere. Why do you drive down the freeway? So you can go faster somewhere. 
Some of you are really fast. I drive to church, and you guys are whipping by me. I'm just kidding. No idea. I'm probably whipping by you. Got to get to church. Got to get to church. If you want to see things we've never seen before, we must do things we've never done before. That's a, a quote from a psych, psychology book. If you, and sanity is thinking that if you do the same thing, something different will happen. That's the definition of insanity. So if you come and live life the same way you always have, even the secular world knows you'll never change. You'll just grow old. But to actually live the Christian life different every day, the way he calls us to, you actually will find the success of his kingdom at hand in your life and in your hearts and in your families and in your businesses and jobs. The timing of the Lord, when is it? When is the timing of the Lord? Oh, it's right now. If we're obedient to him, why, why would we be obedient? Why would he ask us to be obedient to him? So he can reveal his will to us. You need to know his will? Simple, be obedient. Be obedient to him. Well, well I, I gotta just sit here and do nothing for, like, for a year so I can find his will. No, if it's his will for you to do that, then that's fine. But be obedient in your life to him and his glory and guarantee you you'll be on a highway of holiness which you'll walk into his will hands down. It just happens. So it's an automatic reaction of the kingdom. Uh, let's read Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 19. See how far I can get here today. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. What's a for? So you're not strangers and foreigners. If you, if you are, uh, have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are no longer a stranger or a foreigner. What's a foreigner? It means uh, uh, pariokos, which is beside and to dwell. In other words, dwelling near. So right now, if, if you are a believer in Jesus, you are no longer a stranger or a foreigner in his kingdom, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Verse 20, having been built on what? The foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 talks about it. I'm just gonna throw some scriptures out because of time. Uh, Ephesians 4, 11 also talks about it. Verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. A holy temple is a sanctuary. A sanctuary is where he dwells, okay? So, so having the apostles and prophets foundation, Christ as a chief cornerstone, we are literally uh, growing into a holy temple. It's a sanctuary of his presence, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner, was prisoner bondage. The prisoner, the bondage, I'm living in bondage of who? Of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. So here Paul had received a revelation. He's actually as a prisoner to the Gentiles, to the unsaved. Can you imagine if we look at ourselves as a prisoner of Jesus Christ to the unsaved? <laughs> What we usually do is think we got something so big and powerful, they need it. Very true. It's a good perspective. But how much would our life change, evangelism in our own lives and hearts, if we actually felt we were prisoners to them because of Jesus Christ in us? You, get, you understand what I'm saying? That we are living in such a capacity that I am bound in chains to do the will of Jesus. I am bound to him. Who's, who's the chains tied to? They're tied to him. They're tied to the word of God. They're tied to the Holy Spirit. Well, hold it, Jesus isn't bound. No, but if you're a believer in him, you have bound yourself to him. It's a clear-cut aspect. It, well, he gave me freedom. He gave you freedom to have him as your light and living example of testimony in your life. It's not a bondage aspect. It's not a, uh, well, being bound means I can't do anything. Well, reality is, if you're a believer, you're right. You got to be 
bound to him to keep you from sin. If you're bound to anything other than him, you're bound to sin. And if you're bound to sin, you don't have him because he is the victor. So when we walk in our lives and we live our lives, we're actually bound to his will be done in our lives, but the binding is a voluntary choice you and I choose to make in our daily lives of I willfully bind myself to your word, to your truth, to your kingdom at hand. I willfully tie myself. Look at it this way then if you want to look at it more positive. I tie myself because I don't want to get left behind. Because Deuteronomy chapter 28 says that that the favor of the Lord overtook them. It went past them. Then bind me to it. Bind me to it. Tie me on. It's like uh, when you're water skiing or or wakeboarding behind a boat, you know, uh, you, you, you like to, you hold on. You're bound to the boat. That rope holds you to the boat. And you get to go out and have, woo, fun, and woo, you should see me. I do triple backflips on a wake. No, I can't lie. I'm sorry. Don't see me. It's like this big white, hmm, big wave, though. I make a big wave. Just kidding. So being bound, maybe we don't like how Paul states it, but let's take a look and say then being connected, being Wrapped around. But your call actually binds you to him. If you want to fulfill your call, you're bound to him. And when you're bound to him, you're a son or a daughter with the richness of his kingdom and his glory. And you can't escape the favor and the riches of his glory. You're bound to it. Oh, I like that better. That's what we carry out these doors into where it is that God's called us. Mark chapter 4, I'm going to skip through some scriptures very quick here. Mark chapter 4, 10 and 11, it talks about to know the mysteries of the kingdom. To know the mysteries. Actually, let's just turn there real quick. It's a really good verse. Turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse uh, 10. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about a parable. Verse 11. And he, that's Jesus, said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. Mystery. What's mystery? Mystery. Masterion means to initiate into the ministry. Hence, a secret known only to the um, initiated, something hidden requiring special revelation. So here, this mystery, if you look at it, um, because to you as believers, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. It has been given to know that you will initiate into the understanding of knowing something that others won't know. So when we're bound to him, our call comes to life. We come to life. It's not chains that hold us. It's literally his kingdom surrounding us, which is binding us into his kingdom, which is literally empowering us to run faster and higher and fly in his presence. It's being so connected to him that everything we do, everything we say, everywhere we go, will have a presence of his glory with us. So when I, I, I walk past, you know, to Doreen, I walk past, boom, there's a presence of glory of God that starts to manifest itself because she's willing to see and to search his presence in unknown capacities. Why? So she, she manifests? No, because the manifestation of God comes upon her in such a way that she receives an ignition of power and authority of God's glory. Is it me? No, it's the presence that we have chosen to step into. This is not about me. This is not about Paul. It's not about any person in this church other than the person of Jesus Christ. 
And when we, we choose to, to go in and accept that presence and that glory, when we choose to go into those places of his kingdom, the realms that start to manifest themselves around you are automatic because it's the principal structuring of the kingdom of God. So when Paul preaches and speaks and teaches on this stuff, when, when, when he's preaching and speaking and teaching, he's carrying because he's bound in the kingdom. He's tied in. He's wrapped in. He's got his fingers so grabbing onto the presence that everything that he speaks and says, even though people might throw stones at him, he is in the glory of God. And the stones no longer become pain. They become joy. Because you're bound in the presence. You're tied into it. You're tied into his will be done. When you say I do in a marriage, you are literally bound to the covenant. It's not a negative, it's a positive. When I said I do to my wife over 20 years ago, 23, 24, 23 years ago, we're in our 24th year. I bound myself to her. Committed myself to her. In some cultures, they actually tie a, a, a rope around their hands and arms. This is my ring that says it. I'm bound to her. I'm bound to her. And when we had children, it makes me as a dad bound to my children. When they have grandchildren, it'll make me bound to the grandchildren. It's not a negative. It's a positive. His will be done. He has a will and a desire for every one of us. He has a will and a desire for this place, Windward. He has a will and a desire for CLA, for, for all the churches, the vineyards, all the churches around uh, Canada and America and the world. He has a will and a desire for them. Matthew 20, verse 16. We'll turn there real quick. Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. So the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Oh, you need a drink? Please come, come, here, have mine. Oh, 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 you, you, you need some food? Please, 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 come, come, come. Here, here's, here's a plate. Well, whose is that? It's yours. Well, where are you eating? This is your plate. I get to eat of his presence. When I watch you eat my portion, because you have a need. It's like, oh, oh, you want to sit there? Yeah, please take my chair. It's when, if we have a conference and it's full in here, you know the first people I'd expect to get up out of the chairs would be us. It's just honor. It's like loving them so much and realizing that, you know what? I, I get to come here every Sunday. I get to come and be a part of this. I'm, I'm helping build this and pour into this. And, and, and you're a visitor, and wow. Yeah, but they took my parking spot out there. Who dares? And you get out of the church, and you scowl at those people. Don't you know that that's my spot? I've had that spot for 20 years. You know what? Maybe you've had it about 19 years too long. I'm just kidding. I'm joking. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> First Peter 2, 9. We are a chosen generation. Let's go back here, actually, to Matthew. Let's go back. Matthew 16. They talk about the same thing. Matthew 16. I'm uh, sorry. Verse 20, verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 16. So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. The chosen, word chosen right there is to pick or to gather. How do you choose to be chosen? I believe you must choose to be chosen. How do you get chosen? How do you get chosen by God? You're all chosen by God. Everyone on this earth that's ever been born has been chosen by God. Well, what do you mean? Well, some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, teachers, and, or pastors, and uh, preachers, or teachers. Well, what am I chosen to do? I don't know. Have you chosen to be chosen yet? Well, what do you mean? I use this analogy. We'll use basketball. I'm not sure if I've said it here. I know I've said it in Windward uh, at the warehouse. Hey, there's a basketball team. Going to call it Windward. Wow, that was a good revelation, Brent. Thank you. Windward. And Jesus is coming to pick the team. Let's call it Fraser Valley. The Fraser Valley basketball team. Jesus is coming. Hey. Who wants to be on the team? Who here would want to be on the team that Jesus has for the Fraser Valley? Just put your hand up. 
You say, well, I can't play basketball. Okay, let's just, who wants to be on the team of Jesus Christ? Okay, here we go. Okay, well, why don't we all just show up right now? Let's bring out a hoop. Actually, there's a hoop in the parking lot. We just need to screw the little thing back on. I think uh, uh, Mike just found it in the grass, so we're going to get that fixed up so we can shoot basketballs, okay? And maybe we'll just have a little exam each Sunday. We'll just all walk out of the parking lot, and we'll say, okay, here's the line. Take a shot. See if you make the team. <laughs> so the coach, the coach has come, world-renowned coach. I mean, this guy is, is the best of the best beyond the best. His name's Jesus. And he comes and he says, hey, here, here's the ball. Here's the ball. Now, if you knew a month or two or three before the tryouts were going to happen, some of you would actually be type A personalities and say, oh, I'm going to win it. I'm going to win it. Get me the book. Let me study. Find the rules. I'm going to buy my own basketball. Look, honey, I bought an $800 basketball. Because the better the ball is, the better it makes me. That's our type personality. Get the best. It's going to make us better. And you go and you practice and you shoot and you do all this stuff. And, and every day you're practicing, you're working out, you're, I can do it, I can do it. Yeah, jump, flow right through. Yeah, there we go, away we go. And then some of us are like, oh, I can't really play basketball. I think it's for somebody else. So I'll be, I'll be a professional, uh, I was going to say bleacher. I'll be a professional cheerleader. Anyways, Jesus comes. Here, here's the ball. Paul grabs the ball. Some would say, what a show off. Most people say that because they can't do this. What a show off. No, he's actually just showing his skill. Yeah, but why would he do that? Because he practiced. And God gave it to him. I think he's a show off. Well, Jesus is sure watching him because he's picking the team. Now, if he could just do this and then that wouldn't be good. But if he could do this, whoosh. Hmm. I bet the coach would look. Give it to somebody else. Well, I want to be the cheerleader. No, here's the ball. I'm giving you the ball. You got to choose the ball. Uh, what do I do? I saw what Paul did. Bonk. Oh. Here's the manual how to play ball. He just gave it to us thousands of years ago. And he's saying, tell you what, if you just read the manual but you don't practice it, you probably aren't going to make a team. Because we're here to win. My kingdom wins, says Jesus. You're learning to play from victory, not for victory. You're not fighting a battle for victory. You're fighting the battles from victory. You already have the victory given to you. It's just waiting for us to step in to the victory of every battle in your life. He says, I've given you my manual. I've given you my Holy Spirit as your tutor, your empowerer, your strength. Are you ready to play on the A team? And even though we talk about are you ready to play on the A team, there will still be some people that will say, I'm just not good enough for the A team. I'm here to tell you, as one of the coaches of this place, who's being coached by Jesus, you are good enough. You are destined good enough. You were sanctified good enough. You were ordained good enough. Even beyond your dreams and imaginations. Is there a keys? Can I have some music? You're good enough.
because you are created in the image of God to fulfill the destinies of his business on this earth. And his business on this earth is to see every soul saved. His business on this earth is to see every individual living in his favor, his grace, and his glory in our lives, our marriages, our families. His business is to take these kids, to take these young ones that have been out in children's ministry, and raise them to where they can fly so high. His business is not to see you live in poverty, but to see you live in his favor. And the poverty of the kingdom isn't measured by a bank account because the bank account of the kingdom is immeasurable. Poverty doesn't mean, you know, uh, uh, or, 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 or poverty doesn't mean, well, I got no money. No, that's man's concept of poverty. Just talk to the Canadian government. If you don't make enough, they kick in and help. Poverty in the kingdom can only come from what's in your mind. And if you're not a prince or a princess, then in your mind, you're a pauper. You're a pauper. But God says, I've renewed your mind. I've renewed your mind. You're no longer sinners and paupers. You're actually saved by his grace and filled with his presence, with wisdom and understanding. Who's who's the author of wisdom? The man of wisdom is Jesus Christ. And we just celebrated something that he gave his life for. In communion, we celebrated here today that you know what? I am not a slave anymore. I am a son. I am a daughter of the king. That makes me a prince and a princess. A prince or a princess. Sorry, not both. You can't claim both titles at once, okay? Let's all stand. We here at Windward are about the Father's business. And we here as a leadership team are about making available his business to you. You see, you say, well, what does that mean? I'll tell you what. Very few people in business have ever been successful without serving in it or working in it. (laughs) It's a fact of life. Anyone ever gone to business school? Imagine you create a new business, but you do nothing in it. How long do you last? Yeah, but I got my BC business license. Good. How long do you last? Well, I don't need to do anything. Favor of God's going to come upon it and do everything. No, that's called laziness. That, read Proverbs. There's a whole bunch of stuff about that. If this is the kingdom of God that we're, we're, we're working on establishing through the bride of Christ both locally, internationally. I guarantee you, when you follow the will of the Lord in such a way and step into the service within his kingdom, I guarantee you there will be a manifest grace that will come upon you if you have the right attitude to go with it. You know what that manifest grace might be? Could be you actually get a job that you've been looking for for the last year. It could mean that that kid, that the that child that's just been on your heart, that's been wayward, uh, maybe all of a sudden something shifts and changes because you become a different person. Maybe it's just uh, as simple as your marriage gets along great, which is, is an amazing, amazing option. Maybe it's that favor will come upon you in such a way financially that what you think you could make is peanuts compared to what God actually destined you to make. You see, favor, obedience, commitment to the kingdom of God, the kingdom at hand, his established presence on this earth, his established power and authoritative structure that he's given to us on this church. The commitment and the level that we're willing to step into will automatically start to correlate and correspond to who you are in this place. 
If you're visiting from another church, get involved in the other church. Why? Because we're called to. I tell you, people, I left business structure that in the 90s was six-digit incomes that I was receiving. Very successful. Why? Because God said, go into the world and preach the gospel. It won't be the same for everybody, but the call is the same wording that he has. And it could mean that he wants you to be so successful, you can raise up orphans and orphanages and feed the hungry, feed the poor. Could mean you, you're part of establishing a, a flooring in this place. <laughs> no, I'm not against the floor. It's wonderful. Could be the guys that help make a couple offices, refresh them. That was service. You know how hard and dedicated they were? I've been running back and forth, Sharon and myself and, 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 and Mike and Kevin and these different people, that Kevin, that have helped us and Dean, that have helped us move all our stuff out of the warehouse. We're, just, we're actually finally out yesterday. We were here till what, about 5.30 last night? I missed my son's baseball game in Aldergrove last night. Cause, why? Because I'm here getting things ready and serving. Why? Because it's a pain for me? No, because it's a joy. Yeah, but you get paid to do it. No, I don't. I don't get paid for all the hours I put in. No way. What am I saying? Service in his kingdom. Maybe seeing one of the visitors here today and saying, hey, can I take you for lunch? Can I take you for lunch today? Wow. Reap the blessings. That's it. There's the next musicians. Reach the blessings. That's the cue saying, Brent, you have gone over two hours, dude. Like, come on. We're hungry. We're roasting in this place. To find the joy in service is participating in God's business. I guarantee you, there's joy in it. Sometimes you need to take a break. You're tired, absolutely. But let's have so many people that we're all asking, how can we help? How can we serve? Oh, sorry, we have no more room. And we're full with people who's wanting to serve. Any of us that have been in ministry for any length of time are saying, hmm, wouldn't that be a concept? You mean I could actually spend more time in the Word? Oh. Hmm. I tell you, people, God is building this place, his kingdom, to be established in such a way in this place that you and I are going to be able to sit back some years from now and go, thank you, Lord, for letting us be on a team that reached the lost. We have someone wanting to be baptized already, gave their life to Jesus a couple weeks ago here in the place, wants to be baptized. I'm feeling like filling the, the tank up once a month, and do you want to go? Go, let's go. Hold it, I don't have my clothes. Who cares? You're wearing clothes, jump in. Yeah, but I get my clothes wet. Well, what's more important? Yeah, we'll give you a towel. Maybe some of us need to throw our cell phones in the tank. <laughs> So we're actually going to uh, put together a baptismal soon. So if that's something in your heart and you say, boy, I was baptized when I was eight years old, ten years old. Hey, maybe you want to be clean again, cleaned up, washed. We'll put soap and shampoo in there and you go for it. Have a bubble bath right in the middle of service. We're thinking uh, jacuzzi jets and everything else is what we're thinking. That's where Paul and I are going to preach from. He and I be in there preaching from the hot tub. Woo! I give you my heart, Lord. I give you my heart. Let's just bow our heads, close our eyes. If there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and would like to, to have that uh, in their heart, in their life, and 
you just don't know what that means, everyone bow their heads and close their eyes. If that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ here this morning, just put your hand up real quick so I can see. If you're here this morning, if you're watching on Ustream or Windward TV, you put your hand up. If you're watching on the internet, contact, contact us, info at windward.ca. Call us, 604-302-2800. I just get a sense there's some international people that are watching. If you're here this morning and you just feel like, you know what, I have given my life to Jesus and I just feel like I haven't given him all my heart. And we sang about it this morning, and I just want to give him more of my heart and, and maybe try to give him all my heart. I don't even know if we fully know how to do that, but we can sure give him more and more and more every day. And you just feel like you just want to give him more of your heart. Like just say, you know what, I'm going to stand stronger than I have been. If that's you, just slip your hands up real quick. I see those hands. 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 Lots of hands. Lots of hands up. Lots of hands up. Yeah. You know what's so cool is so many young people put their hands up. I love that. You see, people were here for the purposes of his kingdom at hand. Wow. I want to see what church is going to be in 20, 30 years from now. And these young ones, these teenagers now are actually running this whole place. <laughs> We're going to need more sound systems, more speakers. I just pray, Father. Let's just all maybe just repeat this prayer together. It's just uh, so no one feels, you know, concerned about it. Just repeat after me. Dear Jesus. I give you more of my heart here today. I want to give it all to you. I don't know how that looks, but I give you more. And Father, I want more of you in my life. I want more of your heart in my life. Fill me now, Holy Spirit. Lightnings in the heavens are ripping across uh, nations and countries. The internet is so fast, but it's slow in comparison to the lightnings of his kingdom. Wow. Thank you for opening up this place in the Fraser Valley to nations. I just feel like something's been lifted. Does anyone feel that? Like a Maybe there's been a covering on a well and it's just been opened up. Just been opened up. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us your word so we can learn how to be team players for your kingdom business here at hand. In your precious, your most awesome and holy name and all the people said, amen.